So hi, everyone. I'm extremely glad to be here. And uh, uh, my name is Alex, and uh, I'm, I work for Apple. And today we're going to talk about uh, fast testing in general, and specifically about Harry, uh, a tool for testing and verification of Apache Cassandra. Um, making a release of uh, a large featureful project of any featureful uh, project is not an easy feat, uh, let alone um, something like a database. And uh, one of the reasons uh, um, to write Harry was to uh, be able to test uh, um, Apache Cassandra and make the 4.0 release as stable as possible. And uh, uh, of course, Harry was just one of the efforts that helped uh, to make 4.0 uh, stable and good, but uh, um, we are going to talk about how and why Harry was useful in that. Um, of course, the ideas that we're going to, going to be talking about today are transferable to other database projects as well. However, you may safely say that Harry was optimized to be used with Apache Cassandra. And uh, uh, there are certain things that uh, were sort of built with Apache Cassandra in mind. And uh, um, testing has uh, many sides of it, some sort of many facets. And uh, uh, one of the reasons to test something is to make sure that it works. But uh, how do we make sure that something as broad or complex as a database system, like how do we define that it actually works in 100%? Um, for instance, you can say that uh, uh, the update statement works or a select statement works and like something like a read repair works. Uh, but uh, does that also mean that the combination of these things also works? So our job here when verifying the quality of the project is to make sure that not only every feature works in isolation, but um, different features also interact with each other in some way that uh, we expect and that um, different use cases are also covered for the database not only something that you had in mind when you were uh, designing some well uh, some maybe niche thing um, the way we were previously approaching uh, testing was, uh, of course, uh, pretty much like any other software project. So one of the things that we were doing uh, was, of course, uh, writing unit tests. And uh, uh, the people who are familiar with Apache Cassandra code base uh, know CQL Tester. This is a tool that helps you to exercise local read-write paths. And uh, this is useful, but uh, of course, uh, this is uh, not enough to test some like, complex distributed system. And the next logical step is, of course, to try and create a cluster on your machine, and which we did with the CCM, Cassandra Cluster Manager. And uh, today, we also have something we call NJVM DTAS, which help you to create a, a cluster of uh, Cassandra nodes uh, in one JVM and have control over each one of the nodes. Uh, but uh, um, still, these tests uh, were exercising predetermined commands with very little logic contained in tests. However useful this was, this was uh, very limiting and was only covering only so much of the functionality. Um, so, for example, uh, even when we were testing a coordinated query path, we were often not exercising many uh, real-world scenarios and uh, uh, were not exercising behavior under heavy load. Uh, to validate uh, behavior under heavy load, we would usually test uh, use something like a stress test. But uh, using a stress test, you usually only validate the database functions under heavy load. Uh, but you do not check the correctness of every single response. You keep an eye on metrics and make sure that we don't leak memory or connections or file descriptors, etc. And um, one other uh, sort of source of information is uh, a user report. Uh, but uh, when somebody comes to uh, 
a mailing list or uh, to Cassandra Jira, uh, it often happens that uh, uh, they can reproduce the issue in their environment or they had it triggered and then they have certain logs uh, available for them. However, they cannot give uh, committers or contributors uh, access to their production database and uh, uh, they cannot really um, give us a minimal repro which can work for everybody. So that means that uh, um, people who are trying to reproduce issue are sor sort of blindfolded and uh, we have to uh, try and uh, hunt for this issue by creating, uh, re trying to recreate the scenario either manually or uh, in some other way. But uh, um, this often means that uh, uh, you have to sort of create tools to reproduce the issue each time yourself. And before Harry, there was no common tool that was universally used uh, in the community. And uh, um, how can we improve the situation? Um, of course, uh, like just relying on manually writing tests, unit tests is just a no-go. So we would like to have uh, developers uh, focused on things other than just writing tests. Um, but then every time we need to test something, we uh, don't have like, it would be great if we don't have to come up with new ways to generate data uh, because it's also not optimal. Uh, and uh, even if we um, produce like something like a stress-like workload, we would also be able to validate its correctness. So it's not just an, it's just not enough for us to generate certain load. We also have to validate the correctness of the responses. And um, we probably don't want to rely on uh, developer creativity and ingenuity to sort of spot the bugs because uh, like however great and creative uh, all our contributors are, um, I would say that uh, it would be good if they were assisted with some tool in order to do that. Um, and uh, uh, we need a reliable tool uh, to help people find the bugs because this will just make them even more productive and allow them to use their productivity uh, for even better things. This all means that we basically need uh, to generate a bunch of operations and um, have a model that will be able to predict the outcomes of these operations. Uh, but um, um, we can uh, we can also uh, hunt for the issues by simply running tests under different circumstances. Because if we have an ability to create a bunch of different operations and a um, way to verify their correctness, we will be able to do things such as uh, uh, try. Uh, running a specific workload on a smaller cluster, then uh, try a larger cluster with the same uh, set of commands, and then maybe try something like uh, expanding or shrinking the cluster while certain operation workload is uh, running and so on and so forth. Meaning that we will be testing not only behavior of specific read-write commands, but also their behavior in the presence of uh, uh, different uh, uh, operational uh, or different operations. Let me check the um, chat real quick. It seems that everything is fine in the chat. Um, okay, good. Um, so I think that uh, by now the advantages of model checking over manual testing are sort sort of obvious. And uh, here, what we're trying to achieve is not only to automate testing, but we want to go sort of meta and we would like to uh, automate the way the tests are created as well. So for example, instead of testing the system, with predetermined inputs and outputs, we define the rules according 
to which inputs are turned into outputs. This also helps to disambiguate any of the edge cases or corner cases. Uh, when we generate the data, we will eventually stumble upon some combination of inputs that may result into, well, this weird behavior that we previously uh, didn't have a precise definition for. And this will force us to specif specify um, everything in our system and know how exactly it works and functions. And most of the time, just rerunning your test suit does not improve your confidence and doesn't tell you more about the quality of the project. However, if your test suit is always changing, uh, and by changing, I mean that uh, uh, it sort of exercises new behaviors, exercises new commands. Um, and uh, uh, th this um, rerunning or running this set of uh, commands, ever expanding set of commands longer will um, increase your confidence and help you to make your project better. So let's get to, to uh, actual like definitions and try to understand deeper what exactly we're trying to achieve and how to achieve that. We uh, all know how to generate random data. There is nothing new there for anybody. And first of all, model checking is about comparing behaviors. So we compare the actual behavior of the system that we are verifying, uh, which we usually call system under test, and we compare it against the predicted behavior. So um, the, we predict behavior uh, by using a model, which is sort of a simplified representation of the system we are testing. Uh, we'd like to be able to um, describe system behavior in rather broad terms. So um, unlike uh, unit tests, whenever we are working with the first test, we would like to say uh, not which specific operations have to be executed against the database state, but rather which sorts of operations can be executed. So uh, we don't or almost never go to the level of actually writing like insert, update, or select statement, which is defined the patterns and distributions of uh, um, how the data, what, what the data is going to look like instead. And when checking the responses, we would like to make sure that system under uh, test responds only with the permitted values. Um, this uh, means that uh, when we get the response from the system uh, under test, uh, we actually make sure that the data it returns, we actually wrote it there. But at the same time, we would make sure that any data that should not be visible because it was removed or is intended to, uh, because for instance, of the uh, um, failure to not have propagated to certain nodes, uh, we need to make sure that uh, this data is actually not visible. Okay, and uh, most of the things aren't. Uh, mo most of these things aren't hard for uh, a smaller data set, but um, if we would like to achieve this for a large data set or maybe for a data set of an arbitrary size, uh, it gets more difficult. So how can we actually achieve this, um, and how can we uh, achieve? Mm, Val validating or verifying arbitrarily large data sets. And uh, one way to do this is to make sure that when we generate the data, we generate it in the way that we can use uh, or th that can help us uh, during the re verification process. And another thing is that if we can represent any value in a database in some compact form, uh, that would mean that we need less memory during the verification process. And uh, the last thing, if we can reproduce any value we can, uh, uh, that, that we have generated during, um, well, our workload, stress workload, we don't even need to keep the values. We can simply regenerate this uh, item anytime we want, okay? So we don't need to keep anything in the memory because we can just uh, sort of remember it without having to store it anywhere. We can just reproduce the same value at any given point in time. 
So let's uh, take a look at the simple example. Let's say we have some schema. Uh, it has a partition key, a clustering key, and two value columns. And we are about to generate an insert query with some arbitrary values. Uh, values on the slide are not important and are only here to uh, make it easier to read and comprehend. An actual test, we would definitely have uh, some uh, random symbols or numbers. Uh, to understand the principles of how Harry generates the data, we'll try to work backwards from the generate da generated data itself. Every system that performs tests drives the system under test through series of operations. Applying these operations changes the state of the system under test. Similarly, we can use operations uh, to model expectations about the system state. Okay. Every operation that has uh, should have a timestamp and some values associated with it. To be able uh, to make every run uh, completely reproducible, we need to have a notion of order that helps us to make sure that we apply, uh, if we were to apply the same sequence of events to two arbitrary clusters, we would get the same exact results. So uh, the real-time timestamp that we're going to use, like uh, give uh, to the database, is going to be um, only used for communicating with the system under test. However, internally, we will always use some sort of logical timestamp, which is just a sequential number. Uh, in the same spirit, when applying operations to the system under test, we're going to be using actual values, for instance, like strings or sequences of bytes or numbers. But because these values are potentially large and non-homogeneous, uh, internally, we will prefer to work with descriptors or something that we call internally descriptors. Uh, internally, we can represent an insert statement just as a partition descriptor, a clustering descriptor, and two value descriptors and a timestamp. So basically, um, internally, instead of having values, we only have descriptors for all the uh, things. So for partition key, we have a partition key descriptor, for clustering, clustering key descriptor, and value descriptors for each value in in the uh, written row. Uh, we were talking about ways to make sure that we generate the data in some way that helps us uh, with model checking. And one of the ways uh, uh, to do this is to establish a one-to-one -one relationship between the descriptor and the value. This means that we can take a descriptor, which is a 64-bit long, and then turn it into some value. Uh, it can be a string, a sequence of bytes, a double, or anything really. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we can take any value that was generated and turn it back into the descriptor it was generated from. We can call it a bijection. So there is always a one-to-one -one relationship between a descriptor and the value, and we can go back and forth between them. Uh, this also means that we can not only turn the internal representation uh, into the insert statement, but we can also uh, turn the result of a select statement that returns these values uh, back into the internal representation. So that means that uh, basically we can insert some data into the database and then run a select query and turn this database state back into the internal representation, into the descriptors. This also means that we can uh, apply a bunch of the operations to the database state. So basically run insert, 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 and then query the database state and turn the results of this query into some internal representation. At the same time, we can use internal representation of each of the applied operations uh, and reconstruct uh, the order of uh, their application. And if we compare the two, the actual results and uh, um, the, the actual results that we turned into the in internal representation and the predicted results, we will be able to say whether or not the system behaves correctly. Because basically, if the predicted result is exactly the same as the expected result, or um, it, it predicted result is uh, the same as actual result, of course, we can say that the system behaves correctly. 
The simplest way to reconstruct uh, the results is just to use the same rules to reconcile descriptors that are used to uh, reconcile the values in Cassandra. So basically, uh, in order to test Cassandra, we have to be able to uh, think like Cassandra. Um, maybe this is not the most efficient way to do this, but uh, for a beginning, it will do the job. So basically, whenever we have a partition deletion, it would hide results of any operation for which the partition descriptor is the same as uh, the partition descriptor of the operation, and the logical timestamp is lower or the same as the, uh, the logical timestamp of this operation. Or if we have an insert or the update um, query, the it will change the model state for columns in which um, uh, in the rows for which the partition descriptor matches, the clustering descriptor matches, and the logical timestamp basically precedes the one of the operation, and so forth uh, for a deletion or the range deletion. So let's go through a slightly more elaborate example together. So here on the left, we have an internal representation of the query, and on the right, we have an actual query that uh, we're going to exercise against the database state. And in the middle, in the bottom, we have a, a, a state of uh, or current state of the model after executing whatever you see on the screen. Let's say we have an insert statement. And if we apply the statement uh, to the database state uh, in our model, we predict that we will have one row in one partition, and we know exactly which values, um, or, uh, what the values of the columns are going to be. Uh, if we were to update the partition, we know that the values of the columns would change. So we basically can predict the next state after application of two columns, uh, of two statements. And finally, if we apply the partition deletion after these two operations, we know that uh, partition state is uh, going to be cleared. So as a result, we have to basically get nothing. So whenever we query for this partition, we will get nothing in response. Uh, so all right. Um, what we just went through is uh, just a way to use an internal compact representation of data to avoid keeping the data in memory at all times. Um, but other than that, we were just following the same logic as Cassandra would do uh, like internally, right? So whenever we apply operation to Cassandra, it would pretty much like replay uh, all of them and reconstruct the database state in memory. So we are pretty much doing the same thing with our model. What remains unclear is how exactly we're supposed to reproduce the sequence of events. Of course, one trivial solution it would be to just um, reset our random number generator to a specific seat every time we need to reconstruct the entire sequence of events. But ideally, we would like to not have to go through like from the seat to through all the operations up to the one that we uh, would like to have. Uh, but at the same time, we would also not want to keep the log of all the events anywhere in memory or on disk. Uh, it would also be cool if we could generate the data that would preserve sorting of the descriptor that it was generated from because it can facilitate verification. And finally, we need uh, to find a way to account for in-flight operations. Of course, we do not know um, which events have completed by the time we are running a select query or may not know uh, which exactly states every single event that we're about to apply. Um, which state the events have or operations have. And uh, we cannot just reapply the sequence of events because uh, we don't know exactly which events we have to reapply. We have to distinguish between an error and incomplete or in flight query. So we sort of need some additional information there. So to solve uh, the well first problem, the problem of the navigable log, we can use th something uh, that is called PCG family random number generators. I won't uh, go too deep into the details, but in short, uh, PCG family RNGs are um, or have um, 
several interesting properties that can be very useful for us. You can think of numbers uh, generated by this RNG as a long sequence of uh, random numbers. Knowing one number from this sequence, we can determine which number precedes it in the sequence of random numbers and which comes after it. Moreover, we can check how far two numbers are apart from each other. And if we start a sequence from some seed, we can find an index of any random number by finding basically a distance from a seed to this number. And also, um, if we know the index, we can quickly find the number, random number itself. So basically by its index from the beginning of, or from the seed. Basically, we can efficient, efficiently regenerate and uh, any event without generating uh, any events that were preceding it. Uh, to make sure that uh, partition descriptors are generated uh, deterministically, we can use something, let's say, as a sliding window, uh, which picks the partition based on the logical timestamp. So logical timestamp is going to determine which exactly partition we're going to visit. And then the sliding window is going to cycle through a bunch of partition as the partitions, as the uh, logical timestamp grows. And similarly, we um, pick the rows which are visited on specific logical timestamps by uh, deterministically picking them from a pool of available rows according to some numeric uh, um, value or numeric offset of which exactly row is going to be visited. Um, so making sure that two values generated from two descriptors sort in the same way as the descriptors themselves is uh, sort of uh, uh, data or data type specific. So for example, longs would naturally sort at the same way as the descriptors. However, something like a string will not. So in order to generate uh, strings, we can uh, use a predetermined alphabet of like 256 unique short, short strings, short uh, sort them in an ascending uh, or uh, sort the array where they sit in an ascending order. And then we, when we turn the descriptor into the string, we'll be iterating over the 64 uh, bits of the descriptor taking eight bits of a time using the value uh, of this byte, basically of this eight bits um, as an index of uh, in, in this 256 string array. And uh, to make sure that generated strings sort the same way as a descriptor, we basically only need to XOR the sign bit. Um, there is more information uh, in the blog post that is going to appear um, in the Cassandra blog shortly after um, this presentation, which uh, has all this information and much more information about how exactly uh, hairy data is generated, because I realized that the talk may not express uh, uh, some of these things in a fashion that is deep enough for many of you. And some of the data types in Cassandra are composite. So for instance, um, uh, some like clustering or partition keys aren't. And for uh, if we have a multi-part uh, partition key or a clustering key, uh, we would like to use a single descriptor rather than multiple in such cases. So instead of uh, having several descriptors, we take a single 64-bit uh, descriptor. And whenever we would like to um, generate the key itself, we just slice the descriptor or 64 bits of entropy that were given to the by this descriptor. Uh, we slice them into smaller numbers, which will serve as the descriptors for each part of the key. Each slice will uh, use some entropy to generate a different part of the key. And uh, then we basically are going to use a bijection in order to um, generate corresponding parts of this key. Then whenever we sort of deflate the key, we um, convert the values uh, back to descriptors and then stitch them back together uh, in order to compose the descriptor that they were generated from. So basically for multi-part keys, we also have a way to create a, a 
descriptors that sort the same way as the keys themselves, even the composite keys, and uh, that is uh, that has a one-to-one -one mappings uh, even for multi-part data types. Uh, so finally, uh, we need to discuss uh, how to implement uh, exhaustive checking, right? Um, so this is uh, some something. Um, more uh, complex and uh, there is uh, some information already available on Harry um, GitHub page uh, and there is a description of how to implement an exhaustive checker uh, itself. And uh, um, the uh, one of the things that, that is important here is that uh, uh, we would uh, we don't really need to uh, hold an entire partition state at any uh whenever we are uh, about to validate the partition so each operation can be inflatable from it can be inflated or reproduced from the sequence number itself and um rows that are visited on uh, each step are uh, determined from the uh, descriptor selectors so basically there are components which are called descriptor selectors which determine uh which exactly parts uh, or rows or partitions are going to be visited uh, at that point in time. And uh, each row is going to be um, individually verifiable, which means that for um, each row, we need to hold only exactly as much state to verify this row only. So we do not need to inflate an entire partition state to verify a single row. And at the same time, we do not need to keep state of different rows in order to verify them. And the way we're doing this, uh, we are going through an entire log of the operations and attempt to make sure that every operation that has to be visible, that is known to have been completed, is completed already. And uh, every operation that has to be, uh, that is completed but has to be invisible is in fact invisible. And the rest of the operations, uh, so to say the operations that are still in flight have so-called unknown state. And we can assume that if we see this operation, it's okay, this is fine. However, uh, if we do not see this um, operation propagated, this is also fine. So both states are uh, permissible. So this is sort of a way to account for Cassandra eventual consistency and still be able to validate uh, data even in presence of uh, operations that have still not completed. So, um, we can we can sort of discuss uh, the incomplete or in-flight operations that I have just mentioned uh, because we uh, the, the way I was describing it is that uh, um, we allow uh, these operations to be sort of in two states simultaneously. That means that uh, we say that if they have propagated and we see them and experience them, this is fine. However, if they have not propagated and we do not see them and we cannot experience them, this is also fine. So any state is okay. And uh, we would like to be able to get to the point where uh, we actually know the state of these operations and can uh, predict uh, um, the outcome of any read query uh, even if we know that the data has been propagated only to one of the nodes, uh, one of the replicas. And uh, uh, the outcome of this uh, of the uh, query is, of course, going to depend on whether the replica that where the data was propagated to uh, is actually included into the set of nodes that we're reading from. And uh, um, depending on whether or not the data has propagated to all of the nodes, we will either trigger something like a read repair or not. So in order to make sure that uh, um, we can also account for all of these things, we have to actually know the state of the operations in a very precise manner. We can write an exhaustive checker that will go through all the operations and ensure that uh, well, sort of combination of visible states may have resulted from a combination of already finished operations and ones that are in flight. And this, uh, yeah, still assumes uh, that um, 
any of the in-flight operations can or may not or can or cannot be finished but we do not uh, for sure um w which which is correct which one of these is correct um uh one problem with uh, all of this is uh, even though some of the operations are externally deterministic um not everything inside of the cassandra node is uh, going to be uh, deterministic in the same fashion so concurrent operations uh, may overlap in unpredictable ways and in the way that we cannot control externally and messages can get delivered out of order disk operations can get applied differently and so on and in order to solve this problem we need uh, not only to uh, a way to schedule operations deterministically but also we need to make sure that everything that happens on the node internally uh, as a result of execution of these operations is also deterministic if we can control not only high level operations but also lower level ones we can uh, also try reordering uh, the operations or sub operations in different permissible ways to see if there is any interleaving that may cause any problems so for instance just recently we had an issue with accumulator in apache cassandra that uh, was sort of tricky to reproduce because it was mostly triggered when uh, there was a lot of contention in the cluster uh, which was uh, causing undercounts under some circumstances and reproducing it was rather tricky but uh, using a simulator um, which for uh, you, you can find a CEP on a Cassandra website for it um, and this is a very interesting project that you definitely uh, would like to learn more about but using a simulator uh, and trying several different interleaving patterns, uh, this issue has been reproduced, well, almost immediately. Uh, I don't have uh, too much time to go into the detail, exact or deep details of how the simulator is working, but on the high level, it works by representing all the operations in a hierarchical manner. Basically, any operation has consequences. Uh, consequences are just sub sub operations that were created by Cassandra as a result of execution of some higher level operation. And sub operations are created to, um, when, for instance, there is a context switch or whenever there is a volatile variable access which can cross the thread boundaries. Uh, so what simulator does, it executes every operation sequentially on a single thread, but up to a point where it creates sequences uh, or sequen sequence of consequences. So after this, uh, any of the consequences uh, or some next operation uh, can get executed. So any operation or sub operation that is scheduled collects its consequences um, and the process, pro this process repeats uh, until we uh, go through all the operations with all of their consequences. And of course, you can specify which way exactly you would like operations to be scheduled at, whether it's a random walk or some other way, um, whether it should be uh, maybe just strictly sequential and so forth. Uh, this is uh, um, also configurable and uh, specifiable. So anywhere we can have an interleaving of threads uh, that can result into different executions, instead of actually proceeding with an execution simulator creates a continuation, which um, will get resumed only when uh, the cluster schedules it. Um, same thing happens uh, during query execution. So for instance, when we start a new thread or send messages to different nodes, acquire or release logs and so on. So this also creates uh, so-called consequences. And since there is only one thread of execution, there is no ambiguity because simulator is executing everything in a single thread. And we can know um, a complete state of the system at any given point in time. And since, since we control the execution uh, of the events and know which are events are about to be scheduled and know the results of uh, already executed events, we can order them also, we can order them in any way we want. So to summarize and sort of put it uh, back all together. Um, so first, we have achieved efficiency. 
uh, to facilitate uh, the model checking, we have generators which are very space, space and time efficient. We can validate any, anything by using only, only descriptors. And descriptors do not have to be um, kept in memory at any point in time. We need to uh, reproduce the descriptors only during the validation and throw them away uh, whenever we are done with the validation. And we can generate data sets of an arbitrary size. And in order to verify pretty much anything, we can just, well, reproduce the sequence of events that uh, were required to produce, like, for instance, a specific row and not care about any other row in the system at all. All of this is deterministic. All operation sequences are reproducible from a single seed and a hairy configuration. And of course, simulator, uh, which is later going to be um, integrated with Harry, um, is uh, going to ensure the lower level ordering. Uh, visitors and mo uh, models are made specifically for Cassandra. And uh, uh, many of the tests uh, can now be ported and uh, generalized um, for like uh, reuse and further usage. And uh, um, of course, uh, using all of this, we can uh, produce new workloads and test Apache Cassandra in the ways that uh, were either difficult or um, reproduced the, ev the events that were hard to trigger, but are now within the reach. Using Harry, we've been able to reproduce um, a good amount of issues, and many of which uh, you can find on Apache Cassandra Jira. If you would like to learn more, you can uh, refer to uh, the blog post, which is going to be coming within uh, next several. Uh, to be honest, I do not know exact uh, timeline, but you can uh, follow the Cassandra blog uh, in, in order to learn more about this. And I will definitely be posting more about this on the um, Cassandra mailing list. Uh, thank you very much for um, attention. I hope you enjoyed uh, the presentation and learned something. And uh, goes without saying, if you're interested uh, to work on uh, Cassandra, please um, re Cassandra at scale, uh, please reach out either to myself or uh, to any of the uh, colleagues that are present on this conference, and we'll be happy to uh, talk to you and uh, answer any questions that you may have about Harry or uh, Apache Cassandra or um, the ways uh, um, yeah, uh, we are using it. Uh, thank you very much. and. Uh, have a nice rest of the day. Um, so let, let me let me stop sharing. Uh, and uh, um, if there are any questions, uh, you can type them in here, and I'll try to answer. Uh, but I don't think we have that much time. That said, I'm almost always available uh, on Slack. Um, I'm all the time in, in Apache uh, Slack. Um, also on Twitter. And yeah, email anywhere you would like to ask questions. Anyways, nobody's. Uh, asking questions, it looks like. I'm going to turn off. Cheers, everyone. <laughs>